This event is the final event in the series of the city and the common good, what kind of city do we want? And uh, the series has been uh, enormously successful. We had uh, nearly 3,500 people upstairs <coughs> in the cathedral, and the uh, debates and discussions that follow have uh, stimulated a lot of thought and a, a lot of dialogue. And I thought, uh, perhaps before we start off this evening, it might be useful just to stand back and remind ourselves uh, what has brought us up to this point. And I think, perhaps, although there were many, uh, many dissenters, society as a whole rather enjoyed cheap money and cheap mortgages and rising house prices, and certainly the government enjoyed the enormous uh, tax revenues that came from a very profitable financial services uh, sector. And I suppose you could say that society as a whole, not everybody, but society as a whole, rather bought in to the dream uh, that was uh, associated with cheap money and, and turned a bit of a blind eye to the excesses that there were that resulted from the financial services system. I mean, clearly that all ended with the credit crunch and uh, financial services organisations and those people who ran them went from being masters of the universe to uh, whipping boys uh, in society. And the trust between financial services and society as a whole was, uh, was broken. And in the aftermath of the credit crunch, we know it so well, people, companies, and, and even countries uh, have been bankrupted by the aftermath. And the despair, dis, uh, dismay and the anger that followed that, um, part of which was uh, demonstrated by the Occupy around St Paul's, um, requires us to debate and consider um, what the future should hold. And the debates we've had uh, in the cathedral so far have generally identified all of the issues, but I think they have also identified that there is no single silver bullet that is available for, to mend the relationship between uh, financial services and society as a whole. And um, this seminar is an opportunity in a rather more intimate way. I mean, when you have 2,000 people upstairs, it's quite difficult to have an intimate dialogue about any of these subjects. But this is an opportunity to have an intimate discussion. Uh, uh, um, and we want to explore uh, the relationship between regulatory reform and the broader issues of, of culture, of identity and meaning in financial services. But before I uh, introduce the panel, I just wanted, first of all, to welcome uh, those uh, members of the Church Investors Group who are here this evening. Um, and uh, this is their halfway point in their two-day, uh, their first two-day conference. Um, and uh, the CIG has been very important in, uh, they've been important contributors to the debate about uh, this and many other uh, ethical subjects. I would also like to thank um, St Paul's Institute for their, um, their partnership with CCLA in bringing the, uh, the debates about. So now I would like to introduce the panel. Um, and firstly, uh, our keynote speaker is James Featherby. James um, has had an illustrious career in the city for 30 years. He was, for much of that time, a corporate finance partner with Slaughter and May, specialising in mergers and acquisition and real estate investment. So, uh, uh, James, if anybody really understands how the city works. Uh, he na he's now involved in a number of investment activities, both in the UK but also in Africa, and uh, is currently the chair of the Church of England Ethical Investment Advisory Group. He's also uh, a fellow of the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity 
and a member of uh, Tomorrow's Company. He's general editor of uh, Global Business and Human Rights and the author of a number of books, and most recently of Markets and Men, Reshaping Finance for a New Season. James is going to give his uh, keynote speech and then we're going to have uh, responses from uh, two other people. We have Laura, Laura Berry. Uh, Laura started her career as a chemical engineer and spent, uh, then spent 17 years working as a fund manager in Wall Street. Um, and in 2001 she started her uh, non-profit career working for the new London Development Corporation. I don't think there's anything got to do with London, but... Uh, but since 2007, she's been the executive director of the Interfaith uh, Centre for Corporate Responsibility. The second respondent uh, will be uh, Bishop Peter Selby. Uh, uh, Bishop Peter was Bishop of Worcester until 2007, and uh, during his time as Bishop, uh, he was appointed to bishops of prisons and served as the chair of the Asylum Committee for the Refugee Council. And throughout his career, he's been involved in adult education and policy development, and in particular, has undertaken research into international and personal debt. And Bishop Peter is uh, currently part of the interim directing team for the St Paul's Institute. So without further ado, I shall ask James to give his keynote. Thanks very much, and uh, it's marvellous to see all of you, and particularly um, nice to see some people who look to me, anyway, as if they're under about 35. Um, normally us old fogies who turn out for these things, so it's particularly good to see some younger faces. Um, it's a real privilege for me to be here this evening, and uh, can I also add my... Uh, huge thanks to St Paul's Institute for hosting this evening uh, and for inviting me along to talk a little bit about banking. Uh, thank you to Michael uh, for agreeing to chair our discussions. Michael has a very rare combination of talents. Amongst other things, he has a deep and passionate commitment to doing the right thing, uh, but also a deep understanding of the real world. And when I grow up, I'd like to be like Michael. <laughs> Someone said the other day that um, everything that needs to be said about banking has already been said, but also that not everyone who wants to say something has yet said it. And I do feel a little bit like that this evening. My remarks, as Michael indicated, follow on, of course, a deluge of comment about banking, including a series of three quite outstanding lectures um, upstairs here on the connection between banking and the common good. And of course, there was also last week's 600-page uh, sequel to the novel Crime and Punishment. <laughs> what I hope we might do this evening is uh, pause a little to gather our breath, um, to give thanks for the fact that here in the UK, we're still one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and to remind ourselves, though, of the task yet to be accomplished. In particular, what I'd like to do is try and um, make some suggestions about objectives or principles uh, which we might want to see applied to banking now that the initial crisis seems to be over. Now, not in the expectation that these principles or objectives uh, can be implemented immediately, but in the hope that they might guide us uh, in the right direction as we seek to move forward. Um, and I hope you won't also mind me saying that my comments this evening are purely personal. I had the great pleasure uh, of bringing up to London with me last week uh, two very dear friends from Tanzania. They live right on the edge of the bush in the middle of that enormous country and they had never been to London before. Uh, we visited this fantastic cathedral we had tea in the Tate Modern, and we walked along Whitehall. We drove around Trafalgar Square, drove down the Mall towards Buckingham Palace, and we drove alongside Hyde Park. Now, what do you think their most significant reflection was on what they had seen? Well, what impressed them most was that here 
was a highly complex society, but a society focused on valuing the individual and the community. Somehow we do seem to have managed to create a city that by and large does two things. First of all, it knits together the importance of both self and other. And secondly, it recognises that in fact I'm better off when I cooperate with my neighbour than I am when I simply plough my own furrow. One of my cousins went spectacularly bankrupt a few years ago. Both the moment of bankruptcy and its aftermath have been deeply cathartic cleansing and healing processes for my cousin. He has faced full on the effects of his irresponsibility. Now, of course, society has deprived him of his credit cards and he's learnt to live without the addictive buzz of juggling with his creditors. He's learned to live a new life, but one that damages neither himself nor those around him. My cousin's a very creative and effective man, and he's now using those skills within an environment that is safe and productive. He's a much happier man. Now, of course, if capitalism had been true to its colours, virtually every major Western bank would have gone bust, a bit like my cousin in the financial crisis. Just about every insurance company and pension fund might well have quickly have followed. Now I've got no problem with the fact that banks were saved. The alternative would have been disastrous. But let's not fool ourselves by saying there was no crisis in capitalism. Only a mammoth act of social injustice saved us, at least for the time being. But as a consequence, unlike my cousin, we've not properly gone through our own cathartic healing or cleansing process. And at this point, I do want to emphasise that I do love the city. As Michael said, I've worked here for over 30 years. I love its people. I love its creativity. Both my father and my grandfather were bankers for all of their lives. So my comments this evening are not intended to uh, uh, to tear down, but to build up. Another little story. Last year I went to uh, Kenya, western Kenya, and it took me a seven hour drive right across the Rift Valley to the west of Nairobi to get to my destination. Just on the edge of Lake Victoria there's a community of about 40,000 people, nearly all of them getting their livelihood from artisanal gold mining. Now basically what artisanal gold mining means is picks and shovels, mine shafts 100 metres deep and no safety equipment. The gold is separated using mercury and other lethal chemicals by hand. The gold is then sold to local traders at way below market price and almost none of the proceeds find their way back into any social infrastructure, whether that's schools, medical care, sanitation or decent housing. Now the aspiration of most of the gold miners is to strike it lucky and buy a motorbike. Just before I got there, one miner had indeed done just that. He then got himself drunk and killed himself on his bike. I visited one site where there was a gold rush happening because they found a rich scene. It was just like a scene out of a Wild West movie. Nearly every miner I met told me the same story. If only they had more money to buy better equipment and then all of their social and economic problems would be solved. But three things became clear to me on that trip and they're around purpose, philosophy and structure. First, if we don't change what we're aiming at, then nothing will change. The miners thought that just by increasing their wealth, life for everyone would improve, but it clearly wouldn't. The financial crisis has, I think, revealed that we've been making the same mistake, making wealth creation the pinnacle of our ambition. But I'm delighted that everywhere I go now, people seem to be asking the same question. 
What is it that we want in life? What is it that we value? What kind of individual and communal life together do we want? Without answering that kind of question, we can't, I think, find a new direction for banking. Purpose is everything. Second, it became clear to me on that trip that if we don't change the way we think about how good things are achieved and the way we think bad things are avoided, again, nothing will change. Purpose may give you direction, but it's your philosophy that gives you the toolkit you need for the journey. Now, those Kenyan miners are not the only ones who believe in magic. We have built our own false idols. We worship at the temple of economic growth. We've believed that a combination of the efficient market hypothesis, utilitarian calculation, and modern portfolio management theory will somehow deliver for us a green and pleasant land. It's not just that worshipping the wrong god is a spiritual and a moral mistake, it's also an intellectual mistake. Because the problem with idols is that they fool you into believing that the world works in a particular way that usually revolves around them. So money has fooled many of us into thinking that increasing our wealth is the only and best answer to our personal anxieties and our social problems. We think that it provides status to resolve our need for personal recognition. And of course, through paying taxes, we can outsource to others the compassion that we might otherwise need to show ourselves. Nothing will change if we continue to think that we can create a better world for our children and ourselves by continuing to be individualistic and reductionist. By continuing to make decisions based on pragmatism and never on principle. By continuing to interact with the world through a lens of fear and self-preservation. It seems to me we need a different philosophy. We certainly need an enterprising and flourishing business economy. But we also need a philosophy of mutual benefit and holistic analysis. We certainly need banks that are safe, but we also need to trust that long-term financial returns flow from generosity and adventure within business relationships. We certainly need models and forecasts, but we also need to be humble about the extent of our knowledge and our ability. We need as well to learn that the richest man in the world is the man who is content with what he has not the man who makes every decision based on a discounted cash flow forecast. And third, I realised something in Kenya about the effect of structures. To make progress, the Kenyans will need to overcome the power imbalances that exist between mine owners and mine workers, the vested interests of local politicians, and the rent-seeking grip of the gold traders. Now the city, it seems to me, is no different. The city is not a rotten place full of bad people doing evil things. Many of us know it to be a good place in which people are doing the best they can with what they believe to be true. But we shouldn't underestimate the power of the system to lead good people into making poor choices. If there are bits of the system that almost inevitably lead city practitioners into behaviours that are harmful, whether to customers or to society, then no attempt to reform the culture of the city is ever going to be successful. Now, I find these three tests helpful as I consider where we are on the journey of reform, purpose, philosophy and structure. You might, I think, call this threefold test total morality. Ethics without purpose are lifeless. It's only purpose that provides the rationale for the sacrifices sometimes called for by morality. It's only purpose that gives you the courage to persevere. But fortunately for business, there is a paradox within business that unites profit and morality. It's only by serving the best interests of customers that business has a long-term future. 
It's interesting that the independent Salts review into the culture of Barclays identifies the lack of a shared common purpose within the bank as one of the principal reasons for its serious moral failings. Now, I don't have the figures with me today, but in 2011, every one of the 79 largest companies in the world in terms of assets was a bank. Now, if the 79 largest companies in the world by asset size remain focused on extracting value for themselves and on externalizing to everyone else the risks of their business, as opposed to being focused on serving the best interests of customers and the economies of which they form part, then it's going to again be a race to see who it is that blows up first, banks or society. So purpose is key, but philosophy is also vital because morality has to make sense. If we don't believe that courage, empathy and prudence lead to good outcomes, then we're not going to adopt them as our values. If we don't understand how it is that stewardship, service and integrity create long-term sustainable value, then they're just going to stay as words on a corporate mission statement. And thirdly, we need the structures of our institutional and personal relationship to help us achieve our beneficial purposes, not hinder us as we seek to do so. So if there are conflicts of interest, asymmetric risks or financial reasons to be disinterested in the welfare of others, each of these things leading us into temptation, then into temptation we will surely be led. The reform of ethics in the city will not be effective unless and until the city acknowledges and seeks to minimise these structural obstacles to just and equitable business relationships. As Archbishop William Temple put it, the art of government is the art of so ordering life that self-interest prompts what justice demands. So let's try and apply at least the first and the third of my tests, purpose and structure, to the banking sector. If the city had been swept clean by bankruptcy in 2008, a bit like in the fire of London of 1666, what kind of banking sector would we now be seeking to build? Well, I'd suggest that we'd want a banking sector that was moving towards and not away from the following characteristics. If you're ke keeping notes, there are 10 of them. Number one, a public objective to go alongside its private purpose. In practice, what this would mean would be an industry incentivized to help retail customers budget and save as much as borrow and spend. And an industry incentivized to finance innovation productivity and other income producing activities in the real economy on a national and regional basis and of course on a long-term sustainable basis. The recent Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards has recommended that the government consult on changing the definition of director's duties to remove the primacy of shareholders in banks in favour of the safety and soundness of the bank. Now, where a bank, alone or with others, has a dominant influence over the UK banking market, perhaps we might also call for a duty in favour of the UK economy. I don't believe that these are mutually inconsistent duties. Bank shareholders benefit from banks that remain solvent and that serve the economies of which they remain part. Second, a banking sector restricted in the amount of credit that it can create to finance real estate and financial assets such as equity and debt securities and with perhaps a particular focus on restricting credit to short-term trading and derivatives. The policy objective here would be to discourage those activities that create asset price bubbles and to discourage those activities that divorce finance from ownership and therefore that divorce responsibility and concern for long-term investment. Three, 
an industry that internalises its losses. Four, safe enough and transparent enough to be trusted. The lack of confidence in the integrity of the published numbers in bank balance sheets explains why they continue to trade today at discounts to their net asset value. Five, seeking not to sell unmanageable debt to borrowers. Six, not proprietary trading and therefore not gambling with other people's money. Seven, not receiving taxpayer subsidies, either through state guarantees or a taxpayer subsidy for its core product, debt. Eight, having business models that are stable through different economic cycles so that loyalty can be shown to staff. Nine, open to the free winds of competition, driving customer benefit. And ten, with the financial incentives of staff aligned with all of those other nine objectives. Now this, of course, is not the industry we have. At the moment, we have a banking sector that is not financing economically useful activity that's creating significant risk for commercial and retail customers. We have a sector that is financing, I believe, the wrong kind of economic activity that is still structured so as to internalise profits and externalise risks and losses and an industry that is dehumanising its staff. We're still held hostage by a banking industry that has significant power but little responsibility. And significant power without matching responsibility is always a mistake. A thread running through these suggested characteristics is to reduce and to reduce very substantially the level of debt in the economy. Excessive debt centralises power, it increases inequality, it encourages profligacy, it produces inflation and it creates unstable economies and it traps the poor. And also, as we're seeing, of course, right across Europe, it undermines democracy. Now, this reduction in debt would mean two things. First, substantially smaller bank balance sheets. And secondly, a higher percentage of investments, both within and outside the banking sector, in the form of equity rather than debt. Now, on a score of 1 to 10, with 10 being the best, how would we currently rate the banking industry against my suggested characteristics? Well, one of my best friends is a primary school teacher in charge of the little ones, the reception class, and she has just been writing her end-of-term reports. For the more challenging children, she has found a delightful way of being both encouraging and accurate. Alicia is working towards recognising the number one. <laughs> Here are some words from Martin Wolf, writing in last week's Financial Times. The financial crisis has imposed economic and fiscal costs upon the British economy and public finances that rival those of a world war. This brutal fact must inform the response. It is why it has to be radical. Business as usual will not do, because that could lead to national ruin. No industry can be allowed to operate in such a way. The banking industry has taken the public for a ride, and dis despite substantial and welcome reforms, it still does. It is too important not to be reformed. All of us care about these things, of course, as citizens, but those of us who are involved in the asset management industry should also care about these things, of course, because what they mean for our beneficiaries. We make a mistake if we analyse banks simply on the basis of the risk that they pose to the value of our investments in those banks. As we saw in the financial crisis and as we continue to see, the opportunity cost of a lost decade of economic growth right across our portfolios, the risk is much more significant for our beneficiaries than that. 
We need banks to be safe and financing economically useful activity. Not because of the value of our investments in banks, but because of the value of our investments in the rest of the economy. I'm afraid I still don't see any real signs that the government is tackling the right issues or tackling them with enough resolve. Governments always tend to seek to solve problems by waving a stick at the donkey. Now I'm not doubting that we need some sticks, but we must also remember two other things. First, it's only carrots that truly inspire. And second, the donkey needs to be on the right path. Now by now, I'm sure you will have guessed that I don't have a great deal of faith or confidence in any of the culture change programmes currently underway in the banking sector. I don't doubt their seriousness or their good intent. But banks have, at least for the time being, I think, forfeited their right to ask us to trust them. What we need are embedded changes that are not subject to the whims of the current board or to the preferences of the current chief executive. And while the objective of banks remains focused on any target other than the well-being of the real economy and customers, while the structural incentives within banking remain focused on pricely, precisely the opposite to that well-being, then no culture change programme is going to succeed, even in the medium term, let alone the long term. Now for me, perhaps the most important step is to lower the leverage ratio of banks, and I would argue for a very substantial decrease. Some are talking of equity of 30%, not 3%. The leverage ratio is key for two reasons. First, it's the most effective tool for incentivising banks to be interested in the long-term financial health of their customers and indeed of the economy from which those customers come. And second, it's the most effective tool for protecting taxpayers and creditors against the foolish lending decisions of banks. Now, the arguments that bankers make to the effect that reduced leverage would reduce the amount of money they could lend to the real economy or would substantially increase the cost of them doing so are untrue. Now, I'd refer you, amongst other places, to the work of Anat Admati, Professor of Finance and Economics at Stanford Business School. <coughs> Once banks, bankers and bank shareholders are financially incentivised through substantially lower leverage to care about others, and once it's banks, bankers and bank shareholders who carry the cost of foolish lending decisions, the need for accountability automatically becomes less pressing. Indeed, many now fear that banking regulation is becoming oppressive, just at the moment when we need banks to be taking more risk, not less, so long, of course, as it's a different kind of risk, risk that's in the best interests of the real economy. It is said that positive cultures can only grow in trusting and inspiring cultures and environments, and if that's true, then it's already difficult to manage banks because it's difficult to manage a big organisation in a way that releases and values the human spirit of employees and therefore their energy and their creativity into positive outcomes for others. Now, in my view, adding further significant regulatory pressure to control banks and penalise bankers may in fact be counterproductive if one's objective is to improve culture in banking. It's better, in my view, to focus on changing the corporate purpose of banks and on tackling those structural barriers that stand in the way of delivering that purpose. Now, only government has the power to implement many of these changes. But I'm afraid at the moment, with an election to win, stakes in RBS and Lloyds to sell, and a deficit to be financed, the government is failing the test of courage. We may need to stiffen their resolve. Archbishop Justin Welby spoke recently in this cathedral at a service to commemorate the 60th anniversary of the Queen's coronation. He repeated on several occasions the phrase liberty under authority, describing this 
as the model that explains the greatness of this country. Liberty under authority is a battle that the city and Westminster have fought with each other ever since the city started many centuries ago to finance the national, or back then the royal, economy. And at one point, Archbishop Justin said that liberty is only real when it exists under authority, but how can it be that freedom is only real when it exists within limits? The loss of trust in this great paradox has been the undoing of a good deal of our Western culture. The cry of the postmodernist is that there is no freedom if there are boundaries. But the wisdom of the ages, and I would suggest our own experience, is that freedom without boundaries sooner or later becomes destructive. True freedom is the freedom to become, the freedom to journey towards who we're designed to be, released from the slavish addictions and fears that would otherwise control us. And so it is with banking. Banking within limits will release the potential of banks and of bankers to become who they're intended to be, vital and valuable members of society, respected and trusted for their contribution towards the well-being of all of us. Within the open space, delineated by the boundaries that I'm suggesting, there would, I think, exist the room for creating and embedding a genuine change in cultures and behaviours, a space that's free enough to allow banks to innovate and take risks for the benefit of customers. Because, of course, the objective of culture change is not just to change culture. The objective of culture change is to deliver benefit for customers and the economy, freed from the temptation to selfishness caused by self-regarding objectives and perverse structural incentives. I think at first, when the financial crisis began, banks and bankers were surprised by the anger and hostility shown towards them. And I'm afraid it is their misfortune to have become the lightning rod for discontent about globalisation. But it's no accident, I think, that it's banks that have become the focal point for complaint. In many ways, they do represent most clearly, perhaps, the troubled parts of modern capitalism. They're too big and impersonal to be human. None of us, individually, seems to matter to them. And their core product, money, represents a source of huge power, seemingly out of democratic control. Indeed, their core product, money, seems to represent a kind of harsh, immutable, mathematical force that brooks no argument, leaves no room for generosity, and is forcing its logic into every area of our lives. It doesn't have to be like this. As I close, can I mention that when I was preparing this talk, two images came into my mind. One was of an English meadow, a gentle river, long grass, lots of wild flowers, some willow trees and a couple of cows grazing by the fence. The other image was of a North African landscape, that bit of the bush just before the desert begins, dry, arid, windswept. A couple of small lizards scampering across the ground, looking for somewhere to escape quickly from the scorching heat of the sun we have a choice to make. There's a new generation coming through that does place a high value on people. They're committed to justice, but perhaps not in the destructive, rebellious way that maybe some of my generation might have uh, been used to in our younger days. They want meaning and purpose and fun. Now, are we going to pass on to them a banking industry that gives them space for energy and passion and service of others? Or are we going to pass on to them the arid, tightly controlled, humorless and alienated industry that banking has become? I don't want to be over melodramatic, but when you start to reflect on the influence 
of banking on business, savings and government finances here and around the world. When you start to reflect on the influence that the city has on the culture of finance and investment here and elsewhere, you begin to realise that what we're talking about this evening is not some simple skirmish. I don't think it's overstating it to say that what we're talking about tonight is a battle for the soul of capitalism. Thank you very much indeed for listening. <clears throat> well, James has certainly given us a pretty serious shopping list there of uh, 10 extraordinarily meaty issues. I have to say the first one really strikes a, a chord with me, and that is about the public objective rather than the private purpose. Um, but whether government will ever have the guts to do anything about it, we'll have to see. Um, Laura, do you want to respond to that? Absolutely. Um, and indeed, it was a rather meaty list. Um, I'd like to open, however, with a thank you for being invited to speak in this extraordinary spot and to be on the heels of such esteemed speakers, including James, this evening. The funny thing about London is that no matter how frequently I visit this city, I'm always just a little more enchanted. And for those of you who had a chance to see the Turneresque sunset last night, um, I'm just delighted to be here. And so since I am in this extraordinary house of worship, I thought it was important to start with a couple of quotes from people who are um, scholars and practitioners in faith. And your own Archbishop of Canterbury said recently, there are no simple answers to the current crisis in banking, but there are simple principles. And I think first and foremost, James alluded to a list of 10 very simple, very common sense principles that would be very difficult uh, to disagree with. I know a report that came from the UK recently that caused a bit of, um, I'll use the word kerfuffle, um, over in the US was the K report. And the theme that came for me out of the K report was that regardless of how you feel about how markets work and the role of capitalism, this notion of trust and confidence and what we must do to ensure trust and confidence are ever present um, were just striking almost like a drumbeat throughout this rather dense report. And finally, Pope Francis in May said, one cause of this situation, and he was talking about injustice, in my opinion, is in our relationship with money and our acceptance of its power over ourselves and our society. So if you agree with those three wise men, um, again, I think James' reflection is so powerful and so important. So I'd like to just talk a little <coughs> bit about this notion of purpose, philosophy, and structure, um, which I think is a framework that just makes so much sense. So as investors, particularly investors that are related to ethical or faith-based institutions, what is our purpose? I think first and foremost, our purpose is honoring commitments to beneficiaries, to clients, to the people with whom we work. And to honor those commitments in just and sustainable ways, because we are truly among the globe's longest term investors. In fact, I think for faith-based investors, we could argue that our investment horizon is in fact eternity. And so uh, from the standpoint of long term, we've pretty much got the, uh, the market cornered there. But I think our real purpose is this notion of, and I don't mean to be shocking, but I'm going to use a bad word, faith-based arbitrage. Now arbitrage is a principle in the marketplace that exploits asymmetries 
Asymmetry is usually in knowledge or pricing. And I think as faith-based investors, we look at the investment job, we look at capital markets through a very different lens, a lens of justice, a lens of the long term, a lens of eternity. And by looking at things a little differently than just discounted cash flows, as James so appropriately said, I think we actually have opportunities to be prophetic. And so we see things before other investors see them. So I'll just tell a very quick story about how this has worked in the banking industry. As faith-based investors, we have an awful lot of boots on the ground all over the world, delivering social services, trying to heal some of the injustices in the world. And so we see what real people's lives look like. And early, early, early in the financial crisis, we had people associated with the faith-based organizations for whom money is managed by our members coming to us and saying, you know, there's something very odd going on in vulnerable communities. All of a sudden, folks are having access to money in a way that just doesn't make sense. Getting mortgages on their homes, having access to credit cards, having short-term payday loans, having a kind of access, and one would think access to capital for vulnerable folks or folks who are struggling is a good thing. But it was very, very clear to folks delivering social services in these neighborhoods, in schools, in hospitals, in agencies, it was very clear that something was amiss. And so they came to our members at ICCR and said, something's up. Could you talk to the banks about this? And in 1995, ICCR members filed shareholder proposals with six major financial service companies saying, something's up. We'd like you to take a look at underwriting pr principles. Over the next 10, 15 years, over 450 investor actions took place with many, many, many banks trying to get the attention, trying to be that prophetic voice of faith, trying to say, we see something, we think we're in trouble, better pay attention. And we all know how that story turned out. So the lesson from the standpoint of purpose for faith-based investors, I think, is that we need to sharpen our message, we need to get more attention, we need to have more gatherings like this where people of good faith and goodwill really reflect on these is issues and, and take responsibility for them. So philosophy, now the people in the hall who know me are probably shuddering because they know that I could talk about philosophy for about 14 years and bore you all to death. I promise I won't do that. I will actually just talk a little bit about philosophy from the inner faith perspective. And what we know from working with major religions is that there are three things that really unite us. One is this absolute impelling force that has us love however we conceive the creator in my faith God. One is this real call to stewardship for creation. This has been written in every, every scholarly and religious text since time immemorial. And then finally, and I think most importantly, we're called to love each other. And that means justice in terms of this idea of liberty that's bounded. The idea of restraining ourselves in some way. Quick story about philosophy. I was trying to explain with a girlfriend while visiting her grandmother when I was a young student what we were studying in a class called epistemology. And the grandmother, who was very wise but had quite a simple life, said, why would you be studying that? Whatever use could that have? What does that mean? And so my girlfriend looked at her grandmother, and I will never forget this moment. It comes back to me all the time. And she said, well, Grandma, in epistemology <coughs> class, we ask questions like, is the glass half empty or is it half full? And we write papers about 
what our opinion is and why we think we know. And the grandmother, very wise woman, said, well, that's pretty easy, the answer to that question. Half full, half empty. She said, I would ask you three questions. It kind of depends on, am I thirsty? Is the water clean? And who owns the glass? And that grandmother's words have come back to me many, many times as I've thought about injustice and sustainability in the world. And then finally, structure. James had 10 marvelous points. Um, I think we have really learned that leverage of 30 to 1 always blows up. It never works. So sooner or later, we're going to have to put in a structure that says, we know it doesn't work, so let's stop doing it. We also know at ICCR, we use a little mnemonic called RATER, which is responsibility, accountability, transparency, enforcement, and regulation. When you think about government responsibility, as James alluded to so many times in his talk, and you think about this notion of, on the one hand, creating new legislations to help guide us in our work in banking, but on the other hand, not funding sufficient enforcement mechanisms to keep an eye on whether the, that legislation is actually being enforced, whether the rules are really being followed. I know that is a problem in my own country and I imagine in most of the developed world. So structure is very, very important and making intentional connections around the role of banking and sustainable food systems. I don't know how many people in the room think about the relationship of commodities trading and what happens to food prices and how difficult that makes people, makes finding food and feeding families in developing nations who are already stressed. Um, transactions and how we use them are important. How do we underwrite water programs and projects? And finally, how do we use our money to encourage good climate practices and environmental practices? These structural issues are extremely important. So I think what was so inspiring to me about James' remarks is this idea of framing it as purpose philosophy and structure and how important that is as we reimagine a kind of new capital market. But I really think the wisest person that I've heard from at this time goes back to my girlfriend's grandmother. And I realize that as a people, right now at this time, we really are thirsty. We still have time, although maybe not much, to clean up the water. And then finally, as investors, we actually do own the glass. So I'm grateful for your remarks, James, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to be with you in this lovely space. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. I, I, I say the, 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 the two concepts of um, investing for eternity is, is a very good one. And also, I hadn't thought about uh, faith-based networks as being a good early warning indicator of things going wrong. Two very interesting points. Bishop Peter, how would you like to respond? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, first, just a couple of things in, in uh, almost in, in brackets and by way of introduction. Um, uh, Michael was kind enough to say at the beginning uh, a word of thanks about the cooperative relationship that CCLA and St Paul's Institute have forged over this series. And I want from the Institute's side to say um, it's really been uh, terrific and I think um, we're very grateful for that. And it's absolutely right that this last event in the series is chaired by the CEO of CCLA. That's, that's excellent. Um, Secondly, I want to say that um, it, it's great to be at the CIG. And thirdly, um, it's wonderful to listen to James. Um, uh, uh, for some years I was involved with the Ethical Investment Advisory Group, and if you had told me when I was involved with it that, that one day 
it would have the power and command the attention and authority that it now does. I wouldn't have believed you, and, and a lot of that has to do with the way that work's been taken forward, and I, I, I do think. A lot of it also has to do with the kind of crises we've faced, which have made it, brought it up to the top of the agenda, but I think it's important just to say that. Um, I, I love listening to uh, North Americans. I, um, I, I uh, <coughs> some of them. Um, um, and I, I do so, I particularly love it because my theological formation happened in the United States and I feel very formed and owned by that culture. But um, I mention it tonight because of the word leverage. Um, I think it's extremely interesting and significant that uh, leverage is a North American pronunciation of a word that we're used to calling leverage. Um, but it has stayed this side of the Atlantic in its North American form uniquely when it refers to business. Hmm. And the purpose of uh, concealing from us Brits what leverage actually happens when firms borrow their way to size is that actually what leverage is, is about a power grab. And um, we have to face the fact that the leverage ratios of banks have been about increasing their power. Mm -hmm. And that's how they became too big to fail. And uh, that's really serious. And what's, what I think was incredibly refreshing about James's paper was when he got to the end and talked about money. And Laura's talked about money too. And money is what we've got to talk about because James identified money as bank's core product. That's a really interesting way of talking, which those who've been slogging away as the Christian Council for Monetary Justice would have their hearts warmed to hear it talked about in that way. <laughs> because the real problem is we have all come to depend on these huge leverage ratios that banks have because that is, that is how our money is produced. 90% of the money we carry is debt-based. And what we must not f really ignore, what will be the consequences of reforming ourselves? Because it won't be just the banks we have to reform. It will be the amount of money in our pockets. It will be a, a gradual, if we time it properly, but it could be a massive slowdown. And it won't be like... It will be better than the slowdown we're having at the moment. The slowdown we're having at the moment is grossly unjust and unfair to all the people who had absolutely no part in causing the crisis in the first place. People in Africa, but also people in the poor communities of our own country. But we must be under no illusions that if we, if we, if we talk about lowering leverage ratios, it sounds technical. Actually, it's about the pound in your pocket and not having one. It's about a, a real slowdown. The most significant tool for addressing climate change and the over-exploitation of the world's resources is this very point that banks are being relied on, have been relied on, to, to generate our money. And that seems to me to be not what a bank is for. They're about using it, they're about guarding it, they're not about creating it, and they've been allowed to be about creating it for far too long. So I think that James has really, really pinned what's the core of this problem. And all the structural proposals that he makes, which I think are, are, are very important, I mean, it's very interesting, you talked about equity rather than interest, and if we had a strong Muslim representation here this evening, they would say, well, we told you so. Uh, we absolutely told you so. Uh, we should share risks when we lend to each other, and if, we, if it profits, we should profit, and if it loses, we should lose. We should not destroy the lives of people with interest burdens they can't follow they can't uh, bear. I mean, James's cousin may have been irresponsible. I don't know his cousin. But bankruptcy is far from always related to irresponsibility. And 
quite as often is related to the irresponsibility, the systemic irresponsibility that he's been talking about, of relying on the wrong people to create our money and to base it on debt. And it's not surprising if that happens, that debt becomes the way of life for all of us. Um, Laura mentioned about debt as the way we finance housing. It's now the way we finance higher education, um, most obviously, which means that we educate people to think that being in debt is a really good idea. And it's a really bad idea. And I think that it's really at the heart of, of, a, of a very, very encouraging paper. Um, probably the largest piece of content we've had in this, in this series, actually. Uh, that at the heart of this paper is addressing the issue of money, because that is what makes clear that good banks is about making money good again, and making money good again is key to making people good again, because it was Jesus who said that money was God's principal rival as a slave owner, and that we had a choice to make. So I'm really, thank you, James. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Peter. <clears throat> and it's very interesting to broaden the discussion from purely talking about banks, but talking about the pace of life and the pace of economic growth that, um, that flows from it. Uh, but now is an opportunity for, for you all to uh, ask questions. And if, uh, if you could say, uh, where, who you represent. Um, we may take a few at a time, depending on how many questions we've got. So who's going to ask the first question? Yes, lady there. Okay, three very good questions. We'll just take, we'll, we'll pass those ones out, out there. Um, uh, so, James, there was the question about why you felt that the corporate culture changes that are going on in the bank are not going to to, to have an impact, not going to work. Do you want to address that one? I don't think the culture change programmes, um, for those banks that have them, um, meaningful ones, some banks don't really seem to have any meaningful culture change programme at all. But for those banks that do have a culture change programme underway, I just want to repeat what I said before, um, I don't doubt their seriousness and I don't doubt their good intent. Um, but it seems to me that when you're driving a truck that is heading in the wrong direction, putting a good person at the steering wheel doesn't kind of get you anywhere. You have to change the direction of the truck. And at the moment, the truck is heading in the direction um, that it was heading in in 2005, um, which, as we know, is not a helpful direction. So I, I think that we need to change the direction of the truck um, and then good people can help by being at the steering wheel. Um, so at the moment, I, you know, with, with, um, with banks focused as they are on, on financial returns uh, with extremely high leverage, uh, um, you know, debt to equity ratios of 97 to 3. 97 to 3 just makes it a mathematical certainty uh, that taxpayers and creditors pick up the bill when things go wrong, and banks and bankers and bank shareholders do not. That is just a mathematical certainty, sooner or later. And this is not the first banking crisis that we've seen. Um, so unless we change that ratio, things won't change. If the, if the ratio is changed, and I think it is the most dramatic of all of the, most effective of all of the things we've, we've been talking about tonight, I think that would have a radical effect on the way in which banks operate, because suddenly they would really care about um, whether their loans performed or not, um, which at the end of the day is the key issue. All right. Uh, I know the, que the, the second uh, question was about the city, but perhaps you could give a slightly broader perspective in terms of financial services gen generally. So do you think people within financial services have the courage to tr transform their sense of purpose? I think people need a lot of help to be courageous. 
I think, you know, I mean, this, the, it, it, there's, there's a tie into this question about culture, and culture is really just a series of rules that a group of people have all agreed work to accomplish a particular purpose. Um, and unfortunately, I think that the current set of rules and incentive structures and almost the, the cultural momentum makes courage almost irrelevant. You know, I think in any group of human beings, some are more courageous than others in different ways. Um, and so I think, I think we need a profound shift in the external environment, much like with climate change. There are these living systems. Um, one living system is the climate, another living system is the financial system with its flows and its um, pressures. And, and I think that the single most destructive rule change in my own country surprisingly was under a more progressive administration when Glass-Steagall was taken apart. That unleashed a kind of permission to completely change the purpose of banking and it made good people who probably have normal courage do all kinds of, respond to all kinds of incentives and triggers that, you know, I, I think they responded to in incremental ways and all of a sudden they woke up 10 years later and we had a major disaster on our hands. But I think, I think it's external. I think it's not about individual courage. I think it's about how mobs and chaos form and we need an external intervention to you know, put on the brakes, turn the bloody truck around, and you know, do what we're supposed to do. I don't know if that's responsive, but um, I, I'm certainly not one to comment on the courage of individual human beings, because sometimes they surprise us. Well, Bishop Peter, do you want to make any comment? I mean, I know the, uh, Laura's made a very good point about the structure and the environment within which people are operating, but is there anything to be said about the individual people? Um, I, I think that individual people are changed when they observe the situation they're facing. I mean, I think of myself as a not particularly courageous person. Um, I certainly wouldn't lightly jump from a great height. But if my house was in flames behind me, <laughs> the equation starts to be different. And if there are people arranged to catch me and it's a game that's attractive enough, then again it becomes different. So uh, I understand the gloom behind the question, but if people can be alerted to the dangers of where we are, and I mean gradually, surely, they must be noticing the dangers of where we are, I think there's a chance that what previously looked foolish will look inevitable. Very good. Another question. Yes, there's one over there. Let's look at those. So um, I think, well, do you want to take the last one first at all? Do you think there's a relationship between the influences, uh, 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 the whole issue of climate change and, and the, 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 the problems with the financial services system? Yeah, I think there's a really interesting parallel, actually, between these two discussions, uh, which, which Laura's actually alluded to, which um, uh, both the climate change debate and the banking debate seem to me to be similar in that um, we know that what we have isn't working well. We know where we want to get to, but how do we get from A to B? And um, you know, is it, a, is it a, an injection of courage? Um, is it a culture change? Is it a change of philosophy? Or is it government action? And I suspect it's a combination of all of those, but I I think the, 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 the issues are so significant and so pressing that we kind of don't have time to wait um, for some of the other things that might take a little while. And I, I think we, we do need a, a, a kind of shock in the system that only governments can really deliver. In terms of the connection between 
banking and climate change. I mean, I, I mean that's obviously one I could write a thesis on, on that. But um, I, I mean, I think it's interesting that if, if you ask yourself what is at the bottom of the problem on climate change, it's demand. Um, we are demanding too much stuff, and a lot of that stuff uh, <laughs> needs energy to produce it and move it and allow us to buy it. Um, and banking fuels the credit that allows us to buy. So there clearly is a connection. Um, whether you can use the banking industry to finance um, the change to renewable energy, I think is a much more difficult question. Um, I think one gets into the whole area of what's, um, what's the purpose of a private company. Uh, again, I think um, maybe the government has got a role to play in stepping into the middle of that connection between, if you like, between finance, it's not just banking, it's the whole asset management industry and climate change um, by giving policy certainty um, and inevitably some subsidy to move us from one to the other. But I, th I think the financial industry probably can't, won't do it on its own. It, it needs a clear policy um, intervention uh, plus government finance to move us from one to the other. So um, there's a question about unlimited liability, and I'm not going to ask James, because James lived with unlimited liability all of his life. So I think it, uh, I'd like to ask, do either of you want to make, make a, a, any observation about the concept of unlimited liability? I mean, I would, can I say something briefly? Uh, I think it related directly to the point in James's paper about the internalizing and externalizing of risk. Um, uh, when my father needed a bank to keep you know, a bank loan to keep the business going, um, they required the security of his house, and that's not uncommon. And so, limited and unlimited liability depends on where you sit. Um, he was put in. He, he was a limited company, but uh, he would have been a bankrupt limited company if he hadn't actually made his own liability unlimited. Uh, now, I don't speak in great anger about that now, but I, I think it's profoundly unjust. And he thought it was profoundly unjust that that should happen to him while the bankers walked away with huge rewards. And I think that's a very serious matter. And it's, it is about the externalizing of risk. I mean, when you talk about courage, um, if we ask students to get into debt to 50 grand, uh, well, in order to get an education, that's requiring a lot of courage of them, and it's making them take a very big risk. Do you want to say, I, think, I, I know I didn't give it first to you, but do you want to say, I mean, having lived with unlimited liability, do you, do you have a view about what effect it might have? Would it, would it deliver the sort of things that you're looking for? None of these things are um, silver bullets, and there are advantages and disadvantages to the limited liability structure. I was reading something actually the other day into the history of Barclays and um, why people moved away from unlimited liability to limited liability. And there was a reason that completely surprised me, which was that um, if you're dealing with bankers with unlimited liability, you're effectively relying on their private assets, their private wealth. Um, and of course, no one actually knows what the private wealth of an individual is. And the problem that Barclays had in the early days was um, that people began to lose confidence in Barclays because they began to lose confidence that they knew what the assets were that stood behind the business. So rather perversely, actually for Barclays at the time when they converted into limited liability was an issue of confidence, that by having a published balance sheet where you could kind of see what you were dealing with, confidence, at least back then, was, was improved. I think one of the things that's really gone wrong uh, when companies were formed back in the 19th century, uh, you had to register your accounts. You went to look at the accounts as a creditor. You knew what you were dealing with. It is utterly impossible to deal with a bank on that basis now. It is completely impossible to tell the creditworthiness of a bank. Uh, and that is uh, a really deep flaw in the current banking model. There was the, the, the second question, which was whether or not, um, in order to have uh, true influence on bankers, you, you need to have external influences coming to bear upon their cultures. Do, do, do you want to say, make any observations about that, either of you? I think 
I really like to say something about limited liability. Okay. And that, but I promise for the swap, I'll also say something okay, about that. Okay, fair enough. So, it's a good deal. On the limited liability versus unlimited liability, I think one of the cultural things that connects is the incentive system. I think what's so interesting about banking is that whenever a deal is made, more risk means more cost for access to capital. And yet, as we saw this huge shift, certainly Goldman Sachs is one of the icons of that shift in, in my own country, as we saw this huge shift from unlimited liability to the more limited form of the publicly held company, the principals continue to expect to be paid the same amount, even more, even though the risk equation had completely changed. And so it's so interesting how the rules apply to situations that don't impact us and how we can convince ourselves that, well, yes, but, you know, of course I deserve this money. So anyway, I mean, I think it has a lot to do with incentives as well. In terms of the external culture issues, again, I think um, we, we see over and over again that if the incentive structure isn't right, not that you can monetize every human activity, I'm not saying that, but if the incentive structure isn't right, if we don't pay an appropriate price for putting more carbon into the atmosphere than the atmosphere can digest, if we don't pay people for being good financial experts rather than paying them for transactions, if we don't run our health systems so that it is in fact health we reward, not uh, treatments or you know, various health transactions, if you will, um, you, get, you get what you pay for in some sense. And unfortunately, as human beings, I think we're hardwired to respond to those incentives. So that needs to change. So can I, those last two questions, can I open them up to the panel members? Do you want to ch choose any of those to pick up? Can I talk about the consumer issue? Um, I mean, clearly the consumer has got far too much credit, and it is a very serious problem. And um, I mean, a number of people have mentioned the way in which governments are encouraging um, students to, to borrow in order to educate themselves. I mean, that's just one example. Um, there is this kind of slightly strange dance going on between providers of credit and consumers, and um, uh, yes, we do need to educate consumers. Um, and I, and I totally buy the story that I think Michael started us off with this evening, that um, uh, we all enjoyed easy credit. Uh, but I do also think that um, there needs to be a very fundamental change in the way in which banks look at the way they provide credit to consumers. And the discussions that I've had with bankers have been quite disappointing on this. Their attitude is quite a postmodern attitude, which is, they're a customer, they're asking for it, they can have it. Um, whereas the discussion I've been trying to have with them is it's your responsibility to make sure your product is not causing damage in exactly the same way as you'd have a, had that conversation with someone making tires to go on a car. I'm afraid at the moment banks um, make the calculation on whether to lend to consumers based on a kind of mathematical formula about how much they can write off. Um, of course, on the margin of what's being written off are not evil people who um, never intended to repay their credit. On the, in that kind of margin of people either side of being written off, of course, are thousands of people who genuinely want to and intend to repay their credit, and it completely wrecks their lives, the fact that they can't. Um, so that's the audience that I would really love banks to engage with. And in a way, that, that same point is relevant to the last question, the point about um, people borrowing money and losing their homes. I think what we'll have to do is we'll have to, um, uh, ju just before we finally finish, I, I wanted to give uh, our, the panel the opportunity to, to make some last uh, comments. So I don't know, Bishop Peter, whether you wish to uh, make any last comments. 
Um, I think I'll just, uh, I'll just say that I think in terms of the series we've had, we are just about getting to crunch point in this seminar. Uh, and I think that we now know that this has been a consumer education program. But the consumer education is not about helping people to decide that it's cheaper uh, to set up a credit union than to borrow from the profi. It's actually about getting all of us to understand the world we inhabit. Laura. I think we've, we learn over and over and over again how interdependent all of this is, how connected all of this is. And I think my takeaway, besides just, again, the most humble gratitude for being invited to be with you this evening, um, is how important it is to make the effort of the five-hour time zone difference and that big, big, big pond in between our two continents um, to work together because we are so similar and between the UK and the US, we represent so much of the world's wealth and privilege and so much of the good thinking. And we share a language most of the time. So, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm eager, I'm eager to continue to forge the, the connections that we're working on here tonight. Great, and finally, James. You started it off, you finish it off. Um, I think I'd, I'd like to start by again repeating what I kind of hinted at at the, at the beginning in terms of being thankful for what we have. Um, I've had a lot of fun over the last year in going to places like Africa, India, Asia, and um, what has really struck me is how blessed we are uh, in this country, and I know that's the same in, in many other parts of Europe and North America, um, by what we have, and I don't mean in terms of our wealth, but I mean in terms of our heritage of behaving ourselves. Um, if one tries to do business in many parts of Africa, India, Asia, China, uh, you can just be sure that you're going to be ripped off. And that is a very different picture to the picture that we have here because of our heritage. Um, just to close though, what I would like to say is that um, please don't hope that the city will become more moral than the rest of the UK. It, it won't. It, the city reflects the, moral, the morality of the rest of the UK, for better or for worse. And I think one of the big lessons for me coming out of the banking crisis, which in a sense is a kind of philosophical lesson for life, is that um, things fall apart if we each pursue our own choices, ignoring the effect of our choices on others. But if we if we work together and uh, we, we all do better when we combine our own futures with the well-being of other people. And I think that's, a, that's the kind of the lesson that I hope banking learns, but actually I think it's a philosophy for life really that um, things work well when we have regard to others. It's not rocket science. Can I, can I um, thank uh, all of you for being here and also engaging with, with this debate? And, and on uh, your behalf, thank all of the panel members for what I think has been an extraordinarily interesting and stimulating discussion. So thank you. Thank you.